Dinner napkin straight from plate to lap. Price tag removed before gift wrap. Ladies first through open doors. Refreshments offered at civilized stores. Every market has its rules. In this one, their survival tools. Institutionalized possession exchange, fueled mainly by bankrupt oligarch rage. Drowning in syrupy 24 carats plus, pieces practically worn by Moses. Where rules of thumb are in memories burned, yet chivalry's gone when blind eyes are turned. If you're still wondering where I'm talking about, you're not a player, so I'll spell it out. Auction houses, vintage trade, on and offline, a meeting point that's between base and sublime, rare, repriced, caught just in time pieces, relationships handled like you would a thesis. Amidst the awe these pieces evoke, second chances with a first love restoked, in light of all this possibility and wonder, why is there strife and peace torn asunder? Simply put, once the seal's been broken, expert opinion subjectively is spoken. Honor, virtue, gentlemen, amongst men who might find it easier to sell out a friend if the light at the end of the tunnel shines green, aiding to stomach the utterly obscene. Whereas true liaisons advocate for equally true pieces seeking out true homes, meticulous in maintaining legitimate reps, while they identify and disable charlatans. So we welcome the he heroes and their stamina. The risks out there are daunting per capita. In few we trust, so here, circles stay small. You can't be too careful guarding Troy's wall. Thank you. First of all, I'm really impressed that you did not have a teleprompter. She was reciting, and she just looked once or twice at her paper. Thank you for the beautiful poem. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming here today. My name is Ali Khadra, and I'm the publisher of Canvas Magazine and Sorbet Magazine. And I want to thank all of you for coming here today, all 150 of you. Um, this is going to be a heated panel because we're not going to tackle this panel the normal way. You all have paddles on your seats. You saw them, right? You have one side that says guilty and one side that says innocent. So what we're going to do today, we're going to present real life cases. These are cases of friends of ours, the panelists, who have, some of them are art collectors, some of them are dealers, some of them are watch collectors. And we're going to tackle these cases. And I want them to vote, first of all, to see whether these people are guilty or innocent of what they've done. And the second phase is you will have to vote and see whether these people are guilty or innocent. Then we're going to tackle each subject. But first, let me introduce the panelists. Aline Sia Valbaum, Global Managing Director of Luxury at Christie's. Danny Govberg, CEO and co-founder of Watchbox. Claude Sfer, art and watch collector. And Michel Kanu, chairman of the Kanu Group. We're going to start with the first case. Her name is Farah. Farah is 40 years old, and she's a housewife and a contemporary art collector and a lover of luxury goods. She is craving the latest crocodile bag from a very famous Parisian brand. You probably know the brand. They sell very important uh, luxury goods. They're famous for their silk scarves, clothes, and accessories. But the waiting list is endless, and Farah really wants her crocodile bag now. This is a real story. So while Farah can really spend any amount for this crocodile bag and go to the store and buy it, she cannot wait for two to three years, which is the waiting list to have this bag. So she goes to her dealer, the gray market dealer. And the gray market dealer brings her that bag within a matter of 
month, a month or two maximum. She's happy. It's a real bag, it's an authentic bag. The brand is happy, the bag was sold, the dealer is happy. So it's a win-win situation on all fronts. Now, should Farah have stood against the gray market and waited for her turn on the waiting list? Is Farah guilty or innocent for fueling the gray market? Judges, raise your paddles. Farah is innocent. Okay, that's a surprise. Oh, the audience? Okay, so Farah is innocent. <laughs> so I expected a heated debate here, but why do you think Farah is innocent, well, Aline? I think that, um, well, I must say I, I'm not too fond of the concept of gray because, you know, with the gray, it, it kind of indicates the notion that this is not completely legit to do what Farah has done and for the, the, the dealer to resell the bag. To me, it is legit, provided a number of, um, of uh, boxes, if you will, have been ticked. I think the first thing is that you are fully um, cognizant that the, um, the seller is the legitimate owner of the piece at some point. That's why due diligence exists, right? That's what we do in, in, in our job. We always check the art loss register and the various database to make sure that this is not a stolen product, first of all, so that the owner, I mean, the person who sells it is, is legit to sell it. Second, that you have the specific paperwork, so sorry for getting a little bit technical on, on that front, but um, you have limitation to the circulation of exotic skins uh, under the CITES um, procedure, so you just need to make sure that the, the, the bag comes with the correct paperwork and is allowed to be sold. Um, but f to me, provided those, um, those elements are met, um, and the, obviously there is an accountability of the seller. So if Farah, for example, goes back to Hermès for um, a, re a repair. Or I didn't say Hermès, but. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> or to any other brand for a repair of the bag or some, you know, like the equivalent of a service for a watch, then if there is a debate about the authenticity of the bag, then the seller to, to, should take ownership and support Farah through this process. But for me, if those three elements are met, I think people have to be comfortable at some point with the fact that when you buy your property, it belongs the property of the new owner. So why are the brands against having these dealers or the gray market? The brands always fight against them. Maybe Sometimes maybe. it's the gray, gray market and sometimes it's the auction. So Aline know very well that many, many bags also comes to auctions and it fetch very, very high prices also. We should have had somebody from the brands actually on uh, the panel because all of us here work in the trade. All of us work in... Uh, reselling goods, except for Michel, he's a collector of art, but for us, we believe it's legitimate, but the brands, I always hear that the brands always fight the gray market, or the black market for sure, but the gray market, this is where the nuance happens, uh, yeah. and it may be, uh, it may be sensitive. Michel? I, the, the question that should be asked is, where did the dealer who sold it, whatever it is, got it from? And the answer, from the company, the manufacturer. So the manufacturer is happy to have these channels they might not say it, but they're happy because you're creating value, you're creating an aura around it. For them, it looks great. For If I was selling a handbag for X, and then because of the lack of scarcity, the, cre the created scarcity, through auction houses, it goes to bids, it reaches three, four, ten times. So when I come to sell it the next, the next batch, I won't be selling it at X, I'll be selling it at X plus. So this person, Farah, the, the person, she didn't do anything wrong. She's actually doing exactly what they want her to do. And so for, as far as I'm concerned, she, she went, in a, as long as it's legitimate, as long as it's not, not stolen. It's a real bag, it's not okay. fake. So as long as it's legitimate, she paid the price, up, I'm sure above and beyond what, is, what it would have gotten from retail. She did everything right. And the companies know these things happen, and they're happy with it. I don't see any what, what, what would cause this Absolutely. to be a, a fuss. I think she's innocent, but a lot of brands think that this is, this is unethical, and this is why they're trying to stop the gray market. Danny, have you ever encountered such situations in the watch market? I'm sure there's also long waiting lists for watches, rare ones. It's a good question. Uh, the whole idea of gray market, even what is gray market. But as far as answering the question, I think it comes back to Farah having fun. Farah having? Fun. Fun, yeah. So people that want to be in these hobbies, they just want to have fun. And if you can 
sell your watch through Christie's or other means and deal with legitimate people and buy watches or handbags whenever you want. It lets the collector just have more fun. In the watch industry specifically right now, most uh, multi-brand stores only let you buy watches. They don't let you really do anything else. But I think let's take the gray market at a different way of thinking. Let's say the manufacturers, is, as you spoke, we could vanish it tomorrow. It disappeared. There was no more gray market. That was it. Chrono 24 went away. And you could only buy a watch. So you buy a watch for $100,000, and you can't sell it. Who underpins the value of everybody's timepiece? So if, you, if the brands watched it vanish, there'd no longer be a value to timepieces. Correct. Because the only people that support very true. timepieces is somebody like Christie's and Auction Sotheby's. houses. Yeah. And that's very small in the realm of the business. It's maybe three, four hundred million dollars. So I think that the other part is as the multi-brand stores and mono-brand stores realize that the customer today wants more options. The customer wants to be able to have fun with their hobby. The customer is making this change so that you can go to an official retailer or someone like our partnership now with Siddiqui and you can enjoy the hobby more. You can buy a watch, you can sell a watch, you can trade a watch, you can buy a pre-owned watch, you can trade a watch for a pre-owned watch. Like, there's so many more options that are going to be given to the client because that's who's driving all of this. So you're saying that the gray market or these dealers are actually helping the market not only to sell. Yes, uh, I mean, first again, the, the brands, of course, they call it the gray market like it's evil. The, but at the end of the day, like I said, if it vanished tomorrow and you couldn't sell your timepiece and a $100,000 watch had no value, I don't know if a lot of people would, uh, would like that either. Um, I, could I just follow up on what Danny has mentioned? Um, like a typical male, the idea of paying 20 to 25,000 euros for a handbag is something very hard to swallow. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me. And it's better than your music at home. <laughs> <laughs> you have to pay. Having the secondary market, knowing that there is a opportunity to God forbid, you're in a situation where you need money, that this becomes a commodity that you can actually uh, value and benefit from by downselling it. Makes it easier to swallow. I'm telling you as a, as a guy, <laughs> that makes it easier for me to swallow. Is your wife in the audience, Michelle? No, she's not. Fortunately, she's home <laughs> with the kids. <laughs> but but it, it, you, I, quite I agree right, with you. Quite the, right. the and and, and for, the, for watches, you look at a watch, um, in, in the last, in the 90s, Hitting a watch for ten, fifteen thousand dollars was really <laughs> something hard to swallow. Now you're hitting one hundred and fifty, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars. I mean, even higher. The, even the higher. auction was, was thirty-one million. Yeah. Mm. And you, you start thinking, if there was no secondary market, what, what, again, depend, doesn't matter which vehicle, sorry, which vehicle was used. But if there was no secondary market, other than someone really having a lot of money and not knowing what to do with it. I'm a big believer in secondary market, of course, yeah. You wouldn't buy yeah, it. Yeah. This is what auctions are for, yeah. here for, yeah. Unlike art fairs or watch fairs where you buy it from uh, primary markets, secondary markets are there to, uh, you know, when, when you want to resell a piece of work or a piece of jewelry or a watch, this is where you find them. In and we market. also got to keep in mind that for a number of years, all we used to listen to was the gray market was the discount market. Hmm. So that was like a horrible thing because we were dealing with the discount market. Now we're dealing with the gray market is the over-retail market. So it's hard to get what's right and what's wrong. Would you rather have the over-retail market? Would you rather have the discount market? The brands just want to watch the, and then if there's too many watches, and let's say you could walk into a boutique and everything was on display and you can get all you want and everybody had the timepieces. Well, then you'd be back to the discount market. Excessive supply, you're saying. Yes, so I think the number one Scarcity, the number one thing in luxury, I meant, is scarcity. Right. What is luxury Fully agree. without yeah. scarcity? Yeah. So yeah. I think these brands have done actually a fabulous job in the last years of creating scarcity, which creates luxury, which creates a frenzy. And it's not just happening in wristwatches. Look what's happening with sneakers. 
My little kids, want to, they're, they're 10 years old, they want a sneaker for 300. It's sold out in four minutes and you gotta pay 500 to get these Yeezys. So it's like, that's a sneaker. People are sleeping outside stores to buy a sneaker today because of scarcity. So I think we're living in a society that being unique and being able to uh, do what you want, when you want, is, uh, is important. It's a game of psychology, really. And also, I think it's very important to think what, uh, as Danny uh, you know, underlined, like if those brands are not happy to get those bags back, if the clients yeah. want to you know, like have the new color, because of course, ultimately, handbags is, is, are also fashion. So you, know, like you, you, you want this typical kind of burgundy red, but now you want a more scarlet red. If you're not able to resell the bag, then you know, it's, it's difficult Absolutely. if you don't provide your customer with an option. Okay, so basically, Farah is innocent. Good for Farah. Case number two, we're gonna talk about the flipper. The flipper is, well, you're gonna see what it is in a minute. So the flipper, here we have a case of Amir. Amir is a 32-year-old hedge fund manager. Again, a real life story. He collects art and watches, and he's a shark. He doesn't actually care much about the artworks, but he's out there for the investment, purely. Amir bought a series of artworks directly from the emerging artist's studio. And he sold them at auction after two to three years and made a killing. He made a substantial profit. Now, is flipping art considered unethical or is Amir a shrewd businessman? Is Amir guilty or innocent? Judges, raise your paddles. I'm shocked. I'm shocked at all of you. Audience. Now I'm really shocked. Now I'm really shocked. Flipping art is ethical? Flipping well, art if the guy doesn't care about the money. So he buy... He doesn't care about the art. He doesn't care about... He cares art. about the money. Yes, yes. He doesn't care about the art. So this guy is not a collector. So he's not a collector. He's not a collector. He's a businessman. He's a businessman. And he invests in a with some small, maybe, artist but, and but get his money. That's the concept of having an art market. In art market, you have market. In market, you have free market. So as we said, when you own something, whatever it is, you are, it, the definition, you know, legal definition of ownership is that you can resell it. I so, think that, oh, yeah, go ahead. So I think the, the, the important point also that we sometimes miss is because those stories only, only get known about the guy who managed to make a profit, yeah, the upward adjustment. But what about the, the, the person who has bought, a, you know, like a very en vogue artist at some point, and then this artist five years later doesn't, you know, even hold the, 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 the retail yep. values that the client paid? Oh. Nobody talks about that. Okay, I have, I have a question for you, Aline. Does the artist get a cut from the sale? Because Amir sold after two years, and he made a substantial profit from this. Why should he? No. Does the artist get a cut? Well, why should he? Never. You bought a car from a car dealer. You, you saw it went up in price. I'm talking about specific type of cars. You saw it went up in price. Do you give the, the dealer for the future the, uh, work cut? for this artist? His work will become very much more expensive. It depends on the his result. value will go up. Yes, of course. The value I of get the artist yeah. will yeah. go up. Sure. And don't for, don't forget that in Europe and well for for some time in California we have the artist resell right that gives them uh, a cut of the uh, a royalty on every uh, on on the first sale after the primary market sale. So whether it's through a dealer or it's through auction, then they will get a 4% of the value uh, as the artist, as the living artist. And in France, we have this specific provision that 70 years after the death, it will yeah. also benefit the exactly. heirs, exactly. which means that uh, for all Picasso heirs, um, you know, like for, for the first uh, transaction. Can you explain they, this again? So 70 years after the death of the artist, if an artwork gets sold, Yes, for the first transaction after the, after the primary market transaction. So like the, the gallery is selling to Michel. Right. If Michel resell either to a dealer, a gallery, or an auction house, or another the private. The state of the artist. Yes, they will get 4% uh, of, the, yep. of the value. So, so, so it's not exactly like selling, reselling an object, or a car, or no, a, an no, apartment. No, no, that would apply, again, depending on which country, and it depends yeah. where, this it, is where it is. Europe. But yeah. uh, again, in the case, let's say here, you'll find an artist in Dubai who, he, uh, you, th you see something in it, you buy it, um, two years later you think it's worth selling, you go to an auction house, you sell it to the auction house, they get nothing because there's no contract with it. But uh, each country has a different way of looking at it. Totally. I'm just saying, there is nothing wrong with what the gentleman, um, 
Faris? Amir, Amir, Amir. Amir. What he, I, there's nothing wrong with what he did. In fact, I'd, I'd even argue, uh, I'd support what Claude is saying. This guy, by doing that, by making it a public, he helped, uh, yeah. he's helped him. He's helping him. He's created value for something that, the guy is not gonna die. Let me he tell you, paint more Michel, paintings. I had dinner with collectors yesterday, if uh, the audience and you know, of course, there's Abu Dhabi art going on now in yes. Abu Dhabi next door. So I was having dinner with, with uh, a lot of collectors, and I did present these cases. Yes. The gallerists and the collectors told me this is a big no-no. We will block this artist from buying again from us. So this Amir guy was actually blacklisted. Well, everybody said Amir is innocent. The galleries blacklisted him, and the artist stopped selling. Stopped selling. The gallery are bl blacklisting him. Why? Because they want to sell much more higher than him. No, oh, not necessarily. If, yes, you talk, if you talk from a business perspective. They wanted perspective, the benefit and they were pissed off they didn't get the benefit. But they didn't get the benefit, that's for sure. But they, sh they should have done what Amir did. Oh. Yes. They should have bought the works and then resold them later. Yes. But what happened is that he's not helping the career, the artist's career. This is what the galleries were saying. And the collectors didn't like that either. So they said, this is exactly what's killing the artist's career. Yeah. Now, I bought a piece of work from an architect, not an artist. And I was very surprised to know the other day that I wanted to sell the work. And I was surprised by, by the, the fact that the, the architecture firm contacted me, because yes. I was selling it, and they said, we own, own half the of the intellectual I said, rights. But I own it. I paid for it. Yes. I want it because I'm selling it right now. And they said, we own the intellectual rights. So you sell I it after how many times? 10 years later. Ah, 10 years later. And they, I have to pay you them. You buy it from Europe or from Middle East? From Israel? Europe. And I have to pay them 50%. Is it true, Alin? This is your yes, it's, it's slightly different because it's the... I'm uh, sorry, but when you buy no, it, no, they don't tell you. No, no, they don't, they don't tell you. There is a contract, it. there is a contract that yeah. you sign. Maybe you sign, you didn't read. No. no, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no he was very happy to... to Who invited own. this guy? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true that in terms of for certain contemporary artist production and for uh, architecture design or drawings, it's true that it's normally owned half by, well, uh, part of the uh, intellectual rights are owned by the, by the company who hires the architect. Okay. That's, um, so in architecture or in design, it has laws and uh, exactly. regulations? It's How many and years in later? How um, it depends from um, country to another, but, um, but it's, it's, it's not untrue. So what did you, you do? Did you pay? Or did I didn't sell it. That's <laughs> <laughs> a good decision. I'm not going to sell it. Waiting I'm not going to give him 50%. Or are waiting till he die, or? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think of that, actually. <laughs> okay, we're moving to case number three. So we, we dealt with the addict, with the flipper, and now we're gonna talk about the opportunist. And this is a case that happened to me personally. I bought two beautiful works from a gallery that's an emerging gallery. So I like the artist's work. The artist was emerging at the time. This was a story that dates 10, 15 years ago. And uh, I thought the prices were very high, but I still loved the work, so I bought them nonetheless. I went back to my hotel. The next morning, went back to the gallery just to look at the works, to view them again before I left the country. And uh, I saw uh, the, the, the manager of the gallery there who doesn't know me, and he doesn't know that I bought them the night before. So I said, these are beautiful works. Can you tell me a little bit about the artist? He gave me a lot of information which was useful. And then I said, how much are these works? I was talking about the works I bought. So I had bought them, let's say for argument's sake, for $5,000, for example, and he said they were for uh, $10,000. I said, but I remember they were for five yesterday. He said, the owner of Canvas Magazine came here last night and he bought those two. <laughs> so. So you asked for a share of the profit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you I asked for I should have, but the case is, so the reason here, as Danny mentioned, the demand. The demand was high. But this was a shocking uh, experience because it happened exactly the next morning. So is the gallerist guilty of burning the artist's market by increasing the prices so rapidly, or is he actually helping the artist to grow? Judges? Oh, it's uh, guilty. Innocent and guilty. Which, the question will be guilty. Is, he, is the gallerist guilty by raising the prices overnight? Overnight. Uh, I think he's innocent. <laughs> guilty. guilty. Michelle, uh, innocent. He's innocent. All of you say guilty. guilty. Audience? Ah, uh, it's mixed feelings about the gallerist. More, I see more, more green, actually. More I red. See, I see, no, you more see red. More, re more green. More red. Green, Sarah. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, again, it's another surprising thing. 
Do the markets or do the owners or the agents have the right to raise the prices when the demand is very high automatically? But the problem, they are the same painting that you, you ask him the second day. The same it's not painting. the same painting. The exact, well, it was a series. Yes. It was series, right? So the ones I bought were for a price, and then he hiked them up by 50% the yeah. next day, 100%. Um, I'm, I'm not going to point at any auction house here, per se, because they're all guilty of this. But after <laughs> the, the Paul Newman Daytona was sold, or the pop, the very next auctions, the pop the was pop pot. Uh, ah. value. The, the, the range. The same watch you yes, yes, yes. The, the, the range the value for of this Paul Newman was the back, was the engraving. It was a piece of art. It wasn't the watch. No, no, no. no. Yes, of course. <laughs> After 40 years, please, no, 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 this no, no, is I, my I, job. I, I'm not disagreeing. This is my job. No, 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 it's no, not no, your disagree. job. This. I, I'm so just saying. The, the people who paid 17 or 18 million paid for the back, for the engraving. They didn't pay for the watch. I'm not. The same I'm, watch is 100,000, 120,000, 150. I'm not arguing that point. Yeah. I'm arguing that the auction houses, the pop that they changed the range, shifted with that. I'm not saying that's wrong. That's why I'm saying it's innocent. They're not wrong to do that. The market is shifting upwards, and they're taking advantage of that shift upwards. I don't see any wrong with I, that. I sort of, again, I think if you read the question, though, no. you're a gallery owner and you're in your own gallery, and you're representing an artist, and maybe that artist is there. So let's just take one of the watch guys were here. That's why I put guilty. So if one of the watch guys was here, let's say uh, F.P. Jorn, and he had four watches in the series, and you're the collector that walked in, and they were all $100,000, and you bought two of them. I don't think that F.P. the very next day at Dubai Week should have the next two that were $100,000 be $200,000. So the question was more like the series the next day. Now, I think if all four sold at 100, 100, 100, 100, and all of a sudden, two days later, somebody had them online, somebody else was offering them, That's then, the market, the, then the market dis, uh, depends. But I don't think that the manufacturer should, should decide because he did great in that one, no, no, no. that one minute. I, I'm not disagreeing with that as a manufacturer, because the manufacturer would be hard to do that. For, for the artist. To that but as a gallery owner or a, a secondary uh, uh, um, owner of a secondary uh, prop, if you have four, a limit of four, which I'm taking the example you gave, you have a limit of four, and two have been taken, and there are only two left, and the two happen to be taken by somebody famous or someone with significance that would have affect the price, the value of this thing. I'm going to, I'm here as a financier, a dealer, or however you want to call, call me. I'm going to take advantage of this. I'm not saying you don't have the right to I come and haggle with me, negotiate with me, argue with me. You have that right. Yeah. If you don't like, walk away from it. There's no one stopping, no one's forcing you to take it. But can I, do I have the right to be able yes. to lift it? I think the answer is yes. Am I bad by doing that? Well, that's a debatable question. But Michelle, yeah. overnight and 50%? Overnight, a, a thousand percent. But I, my it's point is, like, even if it's legal, he's guilty for not being clever, according to me, because that is something, especially in a, in a limited market where, you know, collectors are, uh, you know, like a, a crowd that, uh, that tends to discuss and, and share information, he's going to destroy his reputation as a gallerist and therefore is going probably to affect the, re but, you know, but that's the, a personal, the reputation of, but that's a personal choice. of the artist. The, the, the yeah. question here is whether he, he is guilty of gouging, if you want. Yes. Oh, again, we, in every business, if we have an opportunity, let's face it, okay, the, the thing, this might be a bit on the high end and luxury. We have this happening all the time. I don't see any reason why we should hold them to a higher standard than others. People, if I have an ad advantage, God forbid, God forbid, you're in a situation where there's, there's a, a catastrophe happening, you happen to have a storage a store of water. From one day to the next, it goes up a thousand percent. I'm not saying that's fair. I'm not saying that's right. But I'm saying, can, will people do that? The answer is yes. Is he, is he smart? Maybe on the short term, yeah, because he, he, he or she will make a lot of money. On the long term, no one will trust him after that. But that's a choice for the other for the Yeah, person. but we're not talking about basic requirements. This is art, you know? This is not like water or uh, food. Yeah. Or for a collector, trust me, art is a basic requirement. <laughs> <laughs> I like to hear this, actually. This is very good. 
Uh, I'm going to present the last case for today, but before I do that, actually, but not you. One... Uh, you didn't buy anything else. No, I bought no them. More. I, I had bought them already. No more case but on you. No, no, no. I didn't. No more money. <laughs> but I wanted to. I wanted to. Um, to before I present the last case, actually, I researched a lot on the net. What's the difference between gray market and black market? So I couldn't find a straight answer, like a correct answer. I, some of them said Ali, black market is uh, fake. Ali, even the gray market, you know, even for the watches. The problem is with the manufacturer, the big company, and the independent. They find the pieces, that unique pieces, or that very small series, they find them on internet, maybe the second day that they deliver to the big dealer or the big representative in the, in the area. That's why there is two kinds of gray market. There is a gray market which is a competition with the manufacturer. Some people Correct. put the watch with double sealed, with the sealed, with everything. The day that the customer have been going to the boutique like 30 years and he cannot get the watch. Even the big brands, even the independent brands. We are talking for all brands. So there is another gray market. It's not a gray market. When you own the watch after three, four years, you can sell you even after one month, even after one day, like your painting. You can sell everything. You can sell. Now they, they put a new law in the cars, in the important cars, and in the important watches sometimes. In the jewelry, there is no this, uh, this uh, gray market or whatever. So gray market, when you buy something in demand, especially those small watches, you know, from all the brands, like Audemars Piguet, like Patek Philippe, like the Rolexes, like all the independent brand that from every brand, each brand has some high piece, very high piece. And the, the people that bought the watch, you know, all the dealer, the big dealer who bought the watch, you know, he go and he put it through internet and he want to sell it That's two times, three times. This is a competition, you know. Competition, and it's up to the buyer whether yeah, he or she wants to But the other gray market, it's not a gray market and not a black market, you know. It's a normal market, you know. It's not gray. But he can sell his watch. He, he owns the watch, he can sell. Some people need money. They have to sell the watch. Of course, Some no. Some people die. I agree, they I don't agree. need any more the watches, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. Everyone has, everyone has some, some, you know, Yes, a reason behind reason. it. reason, yes, of course. Okay, but this is not a question of guilty or innocent. When a watch sells, oh, yes. sorry, when a watch is resold after a very long time and the dealer alters the mechanism in the watch or, let's say, upgrades it mm. or the watch isn't working anymore so the parts are not original anymore but the watch from the outside, you know. You mean vintage watch or modern watch? A vintage watch. Yes. When a vintage watch. This is not a guilty or innocent question. I just yes. want to know how... Um, what are the nuances again? What are the, the gray can, areas? Between? Can you repeat the question, please? If I want to buy a watch today, yes. and the watch is a vintage watch, and it has been altered, but I don't know as a buyer. Yes. So the dealers, how can we trust? Dealers, the most of the watches now are, are selling by auction. All the vintage watches, most, the most important watches are sold by auction. When we buy at auction, or Before, dealer, we don't you, know what's inside. No, 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 no. If, we you never, mean, if you mean 40 years when we start, when we go to ask or when we buy, we used to buy some fake watches, and especially the, the vintage watches, especially vintage Rolexes. Why? Because people doesn't, you know, they, they put the reference number, but they ne never pub published, you know, the serial number. So when you go back to tell him this is your watch, take it back, especially the Paul Newmans or the chronographs, they said, this is not our watch. I'm talking to you beginning of 80s. After people become smart, Right. And now all this new generation, you know, after the Instagram, the internet, the, the Facebook, yeah. everything, everybody yeah. become yeah. very smart, yeah. and everyone has some expert to reach him how to go, which auction, even the auction houses, there is some auction house very important. You see some old book where people take reference, you know, from the books. All the books, there is some fake watch sometimes in the books. You know, you don't have to take wow. reference from the books also, because even the books, there is some fake, fake things. So you, your main question is if, if the watch has been repaired or yes. something. Now, in every auction house or in, in every boutique, they give you a guarantee. One year, two years, three years, whatever. And in everywhere, there is a watchmaker where he can take you out. No, he take you out the dial. You can, the, the they value. They open the watch. Yeah, of course, the value of the watch is like 90% or 95% of the dial, the dial from the back. Patek Philips has a serial number on the dial, so every every serial number should be matching with the with the movement, course, with the case, with everything. Rolex, they can flip with Rolex. Why? Because they they produce a lot, 
They can, they can flip with the, with the bezels, with the dials, with the hands, with the bags, with everything, even with the bracelet, with Rolexes. But in every, now, in every uh, shop where you buy a watch, like our friend here, they give guarantees like two, two years, three years. In every auction house also, they give you a guarantee. And if the watch is not correct or whatever happened to the watch, you can return the watch. You can return the watch and you can get back your money. We had a lot of, uh, lot of uh, cases. cases like this. Danny, because what you resell, you've sell, you've, you sell vintage as well. Uh, yes. Okay, I have a Modern question vintage. for you. Yes. Few, so few vintage. Yes. How important for a buyer is to have an expert? A lot of collectors try to cut the middleman or try to cut the cost of an expert or an advisor, even in the art world. A lot of people try to go and buy directly from the fair or from the auction or from the gallerist or dealer. But I think the, if you're a serious buyer and you're investing, it is very important to have an expert by your side all the time. So how important, in your opinion, is for a buyer to have an expert um, uh, to guide you? In the, in the wristwatch side, there's a big difference between vintage and modern. Yes. Uh, why, why is modern that? Time. Yes. Vintage is, say, 1983 back, and more modern collecting is 1985 forward. So uh, a Nautilus today that's 10 years old, as an example, Many, many people can authenticate that very quickly. You have the box, you have the papers, you sort of know. If you go with a Paul Newman dial. It's very difficult. Uh, very difficult. And it's from 1960s. Then I would say it's much more difficult. Somebody like Watchbox, we are our experts and we are able to identify it. However, uh, it, especially with Rolex, it's more art than science, mm. believe it or not. It's a feel. So there's a huge difference today yep. between real vintage yes. and modern watch collecting. Modern watch collecting, very easy. You don't need uh, an expert. Vintage, that's where you need the everybody expert. needs yeah. to be more careful and go to uh, understand who you're buying from, I think. Right, right. Uh, Aline, uh, Claude said something about the fakes in books. And this actually alarmed me because in the art world, we have something called the catalogue raisonné. Yes, sir. In the jewelry world and the watch world, do you have something called the catalogue raisonné, like when a watch is manufactured by Rolex, IWC, Pierre? The only problem, sorry, Aline, it's for you the question. The only problem with Rolex, they don't give any information. Yes. So there is no information. From Patek Philippe, you can get an archive, an archive, archive. extra archive. From all the other companies like Vacheron, like Audemars Piguet, all the rest, they can give you an archive. But uh, Rolex doesn't give any information. If you have a vintage watch, you can send to the manufacturer and they will send it to the, to the old department. After, after maybe two months or three months, you will get the answer. Or they refuse your watch and they have the right to break it. Demolish also. it. Yes, even the dial, especially the dial because he represents like 90% of the watch. Or they give you a big invoice to, to restore it. And most of these collectors that bought the, the watches, even from auctions or whatever, they have the watches uh, at home, they can send them. After this paper, you can, you can say that this, serial, this reference number with the serial number, with this movement number, correspondent to this watch. So there's nothing called catalog raisonné for you have, the watch market. But you have to pay, even if you refuse. Yeah. You have to pay like 1,000 francs. Before it was 300 francs, now it's 1,000 francs. And to restore, it costs a lot. But the only problem also, again, that nobody knows that now the company restored the watch, they sent some invoice restoration, and the customers or the collectors accept, some of the collectors accept. I'll give you a small example. If you send a Paul Newman, they, they send you a, a big list, you know, invoice. You have to polish the watch. You have to uh, refinish the dial. You have to change the hands. If they do this kind of work with 20,000 francs, this watch of 200,000 will be worth like 20,000. So now, um, yeah. some, some of the forum now are talking about this, this thing. It's very difficult, and uh, for the collectors, we recommend not to send the watch to touch, no polish, nothing, especially the Rolexes, especially the Goes back the to the manufacturer. It's better to keep the watch as is. Right, only right, if the right. movement stop, you can send the watch right, to right. only touch right, the movement. Right, and, right. You can, you can. Um, and yes, uh, Ali, don't forget that, um, well, catalog raisonné is because an artist produced 
object, uh, well, artworks that are supposed to be different, unique, and original from one another. Watches were produced as series. Yeah, so could be editions as well. You know, sometimes the artworks are not all original. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I completely get your point. Last case for today is the conceptualist. So we have Danny. He's 38 years old, and he's a collector. And he wants to purchase an artwork from a contemporary painter. This is actually somebody who said this to me last night. So this person was presented the dot paintings by Damien Hirst. And although this person loves Damien Hirst, she said, I'm not going to buy anything from Damien Hirst because Damien Hirst didn't even touch the painting. It is Damien's factory that produced these hundreds of thousands of works without him. He perhaps touched it by signing. But he had these Damien minions in the factory who produced these artworks. So is this a Damien Hirst? Is Damien or Kapoor or Abramovich or who's the other one we were talking about? Koons. Yeah. Yeah, Koons. Yeah. And the list goes on. Are these artists guilty of claiming these are our artworks? They're going out of our workshops with our names on it, but we didn't even touch them? Or are they innocent? Can an artist claim this is my work when I didn't even touch it? Can I add Can to we that? vote? <laughs> vote. <laughs> guilty or innocent? The artist. Well, Michel, you are the... Innocent. <laughs> the audience? Yeah. Guys, he or she didn't touch the work. <laughs> well, one of the things that uh, I'd like to remind everyone is that it is a very, um, actually, old debate in the art market, because if you think, um, just think a minute of the Dutch painters, like the Vermeer, the Rembrandt, etc. They used to belong to professional corporation of painters. That was their job. They had a very established uh, job in, in, the so in society, and they had workshops. And uh, so first of all, all of the emerging artists, they became artists by working as assistant in somebody else's more senior, more famous, etc. atelier workshop. So this is how they, this is how they grown. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci was in the Verrocchio um, workshop before he became Leonardo da Vinci. This is how Imagine, so what Alina painting. is saying is that Leonardo da Vinci used to paint, but he never signed, or Rembrandt never signed the painting oh, because, okay. because? Yeah, because at the time, you know, like it was not necessarily done like this. It was just, uh, you know, it was coming from the atelier, you were doing it, and you did not necessarily wanted people to remember you as a person. You wanted to achieve a great job because that was the, your corporation and your professionalism. And they did not necessarily think of their future fame and they, uh, you know, when people would collect them, etc. So I think th th this is a more blurry line to that, to that extent that, yes, it, it, it's been part of the, of the art making process, especially when you were painting very big format at the time, then because the artist was commissioned so many different things, when you think of the big frescoes, um, in um, you know Chapel 16 or etc. Then you feel like you, you needed that support, but it was always so that because the the, the original artist has given the, the the main idea and the main drawing, then it's a little bit like the architect. Right. You have Jean Nouvel designing the Louvre right, Dhabi, but right. then he has many other people helping achieving uh, his vision. Ali, could I just follow up on that point which Alim is making? Today, if you went to an auction house. And you didn't know, uh, an auction, and you didn't know whether it was a first series, second series, or third series of Rodin's uh, statues or uh, Degas statues. You think it's a Rodin or a Degas. It might be produced post the person dying, but it's still a Rodin. Could be, yeah, could be. It's like the Warhol uh, prints. So the idea, if I'm going to give you a very uh, silly example, Cisco does not manufacture anything. It does the IP, builds the, the concept, sends it to a factory, the factory manufactures it. Apple does the same thing. Manufacture These are mechanical somebody. works, Michel. This is a true artist that is. Uh, I'm sure Apple will disagree. They think everything they manufacture <laughs> is a piece of art. But it's manufactured by somebody else. Is it an Apple? The answer is yes, it is an Apple. It's an Apple product, yeah. yeah. Is, is a Cisco product? Yes, it is. In this case, they've done the same thing, except the situation is different because we're more emotionally attached to it. I don't see it the same thing at all. You know, an artwork, an original oil painting cannot be a product. Maybe you're talking about serigraphs. Maybe you're talking about prints. This could be the, 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 the example. Like, we can compare it. But an original oil so the by Van Gogh. So the artist can't make the same painting three or four times? I, I, he or she can, can but I'm saying while he or she is producing it, but not the factory, without uh, him even do, visiting the factory. How do we know here, hand on heart, 
How do we know any of those paintings that were done were not done by an assistant? True. We don't That's know. true. Yeah, we cannot find out. Yeah, we cannot find out. That's true. We can find out. We cannot now, find out unless we visit the... the auction houses, before they sell anything, they have an expert and they have the big expert and the big expert, and when they don't know, they don't sell. They don't sell because that's it would why. be a big problem. No, but Claude, that's no, no, why no, no, the provenance is very important. So whether it be a watch that you're no, buying or a jewelry, I, provenance I, is very I, I important. Don't, I don't mean, I, what I mean to say is that that painting done by X, artist X, whoever artist X is, is, whoever artist X is, 300, 400 years ago, there is many generations, you know, till now, and, uh, and every generation has an expert, but the, the expert, before the expert, the expert was is, one or two, now the, the expert become more because yes, there the is ex, much more. but the expert is so making a supposition. They make the test for the... the I, uh, well, yes, you, you, you have a lot of... Lot of different uh, I think one of the uh, very interesting comments that was ma once made to me by a, um, a, a Chinese uh, collector, he asked me, well, is this one... Um, uh, is this one art piece uh, done by an artist that is still living? Because I only buy you know, from art pieces artists. from living artists. And That's I said, interesting. why is that? He said, because I can phone the guy and, and ask whether he painted this. That's yeah. very interesting. That's, yeah. that's a very well. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you just go, so that's have to go what back Danny, to the basics. Uh, that what Danny calls them as the modern from 83 till yeah, forward yes. rather than, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it becomes much more risky when you buy from an artist who isn't no longer living. Uh, so I want to ask. Annie, sorry, actually, this is, it's, it's, a, it's good to buy from dead artists because you can make the story. Because? You, you can, can make, make the story. story. <laughs> <laughs> There's no one to, co to, to counter your story. No, but that's why you have uh, biographies and that's where you have experts and then you. And, and they're all writing a story. Raisonné, exactly. But they're all writing a story. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if this painting was done by this person or was it done by his atelier or was it done by his assistant. I don't know. True, true. And to go to the there's details. No one to yeah. mm -hmm. Because the person's dead and the, uh, all the other people who are dead, I can make up whatever story I want. And if you make it good enough, we sell it or not. There is a risk. I fully agree. Now, I want to I refresh everyone's memory. We have, yes, we have uh, the addict. We spoke about the addict we, uh, who bought the, the, the bag, the croco bag. We spoke about the opportunist who sold me the works um, uh, double the price the next morning. Uh, who, who sorry, sorry, told me the works were double the value the next morning. We have the flipper who's buying arts from the artist and then selling them after two years and making a killing of the profit. And then we have the conceptualist, the artist who um, uh, didn't touch the work, but is claiming that this is his or her work. So if any of the audience has any, have any questions about these four cases, the floor is yours before we move on to the next panel. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rob Cordo. I'm from Watch Pro magazine. Uh, we heard this morning at a, at a similar panel about uh, flippers in, in the watch industry and how certain watch brands are creating blacklists that are shared among authorized dealers, and those authorized dealers are encouraged or even instructed to not sell their watches to people who have been flipping watches. My, my question is, where's the, where's the ethics around that? Because if I bought a watch, it's my watch. I feel I can sell it within one, one month, six months, six years. Absolutely. So Danny had, has an answer probably to that, because he did uh, tackle on the this, this, this subject. Um, the I secondary think, market, or the dealers. Yeah, I think that the whole flipping of watches is a big uh, topic. I look at it that you have a relationship with your, first of all, let's take time. I think anybody that owns a watch for two years should be able to do whatever he wants with the watch. Um, but I think it comes down to your relationship with your retailer. So if you're being offered a special watch and you know that the retailer is under scrutiny, you should have a relationship with him of integrity. So if you say to your, the authorized retailer, look, I'll hold it for two or three years, then the retailer says, okay, buy the watch, you're gonna hold it for two or three years, enjoy the watch, and then do whatever you want with it. You can't be married to the watch forever. <laughs> I think if you tell your retailer who you have a relationship with, I'm gonna hold it, I'm gonna wear it, I'm gonna enjoy it for two or three years, and 20 minutes later, it's on Crown 24, I think that there's, <laughs> Uh, a lack of integrity amongst the person buying the watch because it should be an integrity business. It shouldn't be a one lies to the other kind of business. So I think that it comes down to integrity. Should you have to own a watch for the rest of your life? Of course not. Should you 
be allowed to enjoy a watch for a year or two years uh, and not sell it so, the, so that the relationship of your retailer is not damaged, the relationship of you uh, explaining to the retailer that you're not doing it strictly for profit? Yeah, I think that comes to friendship. And I bring it back, I bring the whole hobby back to fun. If you knew you were gonna buy a watch and how to keep it forever, and the only thing that you could do in this hobby is collect forever, uh, I don't think you'd have as much fun. So same as in art, if every time you bought a piece of art at Christie's, the only thing you were allowed to do is keep it. You were never allowed to resell it or upgrade it. Uh -huh. So you, you're with it, so you're with this person selling the watch? Yeah, Flipping. I'm with the person selling it as long as there's an integrity between the dealer and between the, the customer. I would feel bad if I was dealing with yourself and you said to me, look, I'm gonna keep the watch for a few years. Of course, if something bad happens, like you said, a tragedy, yeah. and you sold the watch under a situation of tragedy, everybody can understand that. If there wasn't a tragedy and 12 hours later the watch has been sold, I think that then there's a lack of integrity between our relationship. Not that you can't do it, of course you can. That's it, if there's a tragedy, it's halal. <laughs> if there's no tragedy, it's not halal to sell. I, I, I support it that. is allowed. There's just a. I agree a with you. I, I support everything you say, except that keeping things forever is the wrong thing. Oh no no. <laughs> but if you love it, Michelle, if you love the painting, you want to keep it for the next generation. You don't need to sell it. it it's, it's think of know. Alibaba's cavern. That's my mentality. It comes into the cavern and <laughs> it's gonna stay there. But that's your prerogative. But. But if you wanted to liquidate that tomorrow, nobody, just like you Correct. said, nobody yes, can tell I, you I concur with what you're saying. Yeah. And I, I agree that this is ultimately a topic of ethic. By uh, being invited to buy something that is in so search or supply, while well, you know everybody else would want it, uh, you feel you're being given a privilege. And like any other privilege you get in life, you want to make a careful use of it, and you, you're conscious you're having some things that maybe other people don't, so I we'll treat, it, treat it correctly and carefully. I fully agree. Any other questions in the audience? I was just wondering, has Christie's or Watchbox adapted uh, or is thinking of adapting blockchain models for uh, authenticating? Yes, so blockchain um, is a very interesting uh, topic. I think, first of all, um, when I'm we, not familiar with the term, can you so, explain? Yes, of course, the blockchain is some, well, let's say digital space where you can store information to make blockchain. it public and forever. I get it, yeah. okay. Blockchain. Okay. So uh, the, the one thing is, um, blockchain can, if you look at things from two angles, the object and the client, of course, blockchain can be used for the client because it would be contrary to a very uh, specific um, uh, rule of law that exists in Europe called the, um, the uh, data protection uh, regulation, and I think the, the U.S. is now considering uh, developing the same thing. So basically, everybody is due to its own privacy, and you can't store information relating to the client in the blockchain. But what you could do it would be to store information about the watch and the object in the blockchain, so that people can just go there and check and compare, and that would be available for every one of us to be able to to check this information. I think on, uh, this is a very good idea and some things that at Christie's we have already pioneered for some artworks, uh, for example, for certain contemporary art collections. And we definitely look into this. It exists for diamonds already. Um, so that is the type of thing that we are uh, definitely looking into. Um, of course, we have to be very uh, cognizant that it could open uh, the door to, um, to fakes also because the moment we started to print in our catalogs uh, serial numbers, then people started to produce fake with the same serial number and they say, this is an, an, an authentic watch because look, this is written, Christy, this is, this is matching with the picture they have here. So, but one was a fake and one was the original. So we, we have to give it really careful thought what kind of uh, absolutely non-reproductible information can you put in the blockchain so that it will really help the whole market, collectors, dealers, and auction houses uh, and brands all together or whether that will open another Pandora box uh, about authenticity. Any other questions, sir? I think whether you're talking about art or jewelry or watches, they're all essentially assets that depreciate over time, typically. But a free market dynamic will determine the value at a later stage. I think where it gets unfair is these days, supply is in such a short, there is such a short supply of products, especially in watches. And, and these watches can only produce in such a small uh, quantity that you, you, you create lists. 
So the watches are creating an unfair scenario where you have lists sometimes three to five years for a watch. And, and some people on those, on those lists decide, I'm going to flip it. And then the flip becomes higher because there's such demand. So in a way, it's the watches, the, watch, the brand's fault for putting people on the list that wanted to flip. But then again, it's a free market dynamic and they're allowed to sell. Um, so the only thing that really they should do is increase supply because a free market dynamic would allow other people to be happy. As you say, it's about the fun. But there's no fun if you're told you have to wait five years for a watch. Yeah. You don't have to wait five years. You could wait five minutes. So it just comes down to what you're willing to pay. So at Watchbox, all the watches that we speak about are available now. They're just available at the current market value. Um, if you want to wait five years, and there's plenty of people that want to wait five years, then, then they wait. But it's no different than in, like I said, it's no different than trying to get a Ferrari you could wait for years to get a Ferrari, but many times you can get a Ferrari very quickly if you pay the, the, the price. Same with these bags that we're talking about. There's no, shortage of, there's no shortage of Birkin bags. In fact, there's thousands of them on these platforms. You can buy them tomorrow. But if you walk into any of these, these uh, stores, you don't necessarily get it tomorrow. So I think, again, scarcity creates the luxury, creates the fun. And luxury creates the frenzy. And the luxury creates the frenzy because if you could get them everywhere you want it, I guarantee most people in the room wouldn't want it. Because um, then everybody would have it. So I think that it's, uh, it's a circle. It's just a circle and it comes down to uh, the person who waits has fun. The person who gets it in five minutes has fun. The person that goes on a hunt to find it at retail and calls all over the world to get it. He has fun. And the person that just drives the watch box and picks it up tomorrow, he has fun. So as long as everybody's having fun, I think the industry wins. Because that's what it's all about anyway. We're not, you know, we're not uh, solving world peace selling a, a watch over retail. We're just trying to create an industry of fun. Um, may I just add to the, the point uh, on the issue of scarcity? Depending on the type of watch, the higher the complex the watch is, or even the handbag or the painting, the more time you need. It is, I'm sorry, there's no if, ands, or buts about it. Um, manufacturing of a certain brand, lower end of a certain brand, and the higher end of a certain brand, it's the watch, one is easily manufactured by uh, production machines, and the other one is hand done. And one is going to take time no matter what. We've had a few issues, a population growth, an explosion of a lot of uh, discretionary income for a lot of people and become multi-billionaires because of the um, internet and all that for the last 10, 15 years. And everyone wants to be special. <clears throat> so they're taking advantage. I'm not saying the manufacturer is not taking advantage of it. But there is some, in some cases, scarcity is not because they want to be scarce. In some cases, they can't, keep, they can't keep up. It takes a long time. I've been to. Too many, at least on the watch side, too many watch ateliers, and I watch them with awe because there's no way in hell, if you took me 10 years to sit and do what they're doing with the patience you need, I wouldn't do it. I just wouldn't do it. So to get the people, the number of people that are needed to do this, is incredible. So um, I, I understand them playing with it, uh, the manufacturer playing with that advantage, but in some cases it's really out of their hands. If the audience is interested to learn more about the gray market, I advise you to check out the gray market. Did I say the art market? To check out the gray market by Tim Schneider on Artnet. Very, very interesting read. Tim Schneider again. Um, Aline said something on point, which was blurred lines earlier. And on that note, I'd like to leave you. DJ, are you ready? On that note, I'd like to leave you with Blurred Lines by Robin Thicke and Farewell Williams. Thank you very much. Have a good weekend. Thank you. DJ.